all there yet, but I'll, I'll get going here in a minute. Amen. All right, let's go and look at Genesis. We're going to look at the life of Isaac this morning, and uh, as we get uh, chapter 21 and 22, and uh, as we continue to go through an overview of the Bible itself and get a, a bird's eye view of the Bible and how it fits together as a puzzle, and we're going to look at the birth of Isaac this morning uh, to begin with. So if you look at Genesis 21 and, and verse 1, it, eventually here in a minute we'll have our slides up here, but for now we'll use the Bible. Go ahead and look at Genesis 21 and verse 1. We're going to look at the birth of, of Isaac. And we're going to see that his birth was a fulfillment of God's promise, a fulfillment of God's promise. In Genesis 21, verse 1 and 2, it says here, it says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken unto him. And so we see that God has spoken. It was a prophecy here. And we see the fulfillment of God's promise. It came true. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Aren't you glad we have a God that cannot lie, as it says in Titus 1.2? In this world of uh, unchangeable, or unchanging, ever-changing uh, resolution and resolve, we have a, a promise from God that who cannot lie, that we can take a stand on. Amen? The second thing we see is that we see the birth was a miracle. A birth was a miracle. In Genesis 21, verse 2, again, we see here that, uh, that Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son. And then it says here, I want you to get this, in his old age. And then again, it says, at the set time which God had spoken to him. Then in verse 5, it says, and Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. We know he waited 25 years after God called him out of the earth, Chaldees. And so he waited 25 long years for this promise. And I believe God waited so he can get all the glory. We see that right here. And so we see it was a miracle, just like the birth of Jesus Christ was a miracle. In this, we see that Isaac was a type of Christ. We see here in the Bible. And his birth was a miracle as well. I can imagine having a child at 100 years of age. More, more, more of my wife. She's the one who has to do all the work, amen. Uh, but I, I mentioned this before, but changing diapers at 100 years old would be pretty tough. I, I had a difficult time at age 30, I can imagine. Well, anyway, the third thing we see here is that his birth was the occasion of joy. His birth was an occasion of joy. In Genesis 21, look at verse 6. We see that his name, actually, Isaac, meant laughter. It meant laughter and brought great joy to many people. In Genesis 21, verse 6, it says, And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And that's what God does when he, he, he fulfills his promises. Uh, he does it in a way where we automatically know that it was him and that he gets all the glory. We see that many people rejoice as, as a result of that. And we see that here. And so in this too, we see that Isaac was a type of Christ because we know that in the book of Luke in chapter 2, there was a prophecy there that was fulfilled. In verse 10, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I will bring you great good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And so we see that, that being birthed there, a great joy when Jesus Christ was born as well. The fourth thing we see is that his birth was symbolic of the new covenant of grace and blessings. We're going to spend a little bit of time here, okay? Uh, look at Genesis 21, and look at verse 19. Verse 19 through 21. Here we're going to see a symbolic contrast between Ismael, who depicts the Old Testament or Old Covenant of works and curses or, the, or religion, versus a true faith in, in which uh, Isaac represents. Go ahead and look at uh, verse 19. It says, And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Speaking of Ishmael, we know the story that Abraham sent off uh, Ishmael with his mother, Hagar, because they were not of the promise. You remember that story? And he sent him off with a bottle of water, pretty much, and a little bit, very little to eat. And they got to a point where uh, they were despaired, they were without food. So she took uh, Ishmael and, and pretty much put him away so she could not hear him when he cried for hunger and thirst. And left him pretty much to die because he had no other option. And here we see God sent a miracle here. It says in verse 19, And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew. And now here is where we see that he begins to depict an old covenant or, 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 or religious religiosity here. It says he dwelt in the wilderness. Now, if you remember when we studied Cain and Abel, Cain represented the false prophets or false religion. And God cursed him by sending him out into a wilderness so he could be a vagabond. Remember that? And a wanderer. 
And so he, he wandered aimlessly. And that's the kind of the condition of a lost person there without hope. And it says here that the lad grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And so we know that Egypt also represents a type of world. And so the world is lost. The world is in sin. They're hopeless. They're helpless. And that represents the old covenant of works and curses. We get a better picture of this in Romans chapter 9 and, and verse 7 through 9. Let's go ahead and look at that. It says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise at this time, Will I come and Sarah shall have a son? And so we see very carefully that uh, Isaac is a picture of true faith in Christ, and Ishmael is, is a, that of depicts religiosity and works that are cursed under the law. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And uh, I know this is quite a few scriptures, but we'll look at some things in here that when you read this, it'll kind of come to life for you in the future when you're reading the New Testament. You can see how that ties back into uh, this story. I love how the Old Testament and New Testament tie together. And fit together like a puzzle. But in Galatians 4 and verse 21, it says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. And these are those who obviously uh, seek their own religion and, and keep under their own uh, beliefs, even though they're not biblical. It says here that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? And we know the Bible says the law is our schoolmaster uh, bringing us unto Christ. It's to show us that we cannot keep them, that it's impossible so that we might see our sin and see our need of Christ. In verse 22, it says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one was a bun maid, the other a free woman. So well, without Christ, we're slaves to sin. We're slaves to Satan. Amen. We're bond to him. But in Christ, we have freedom. We have liberty. Amen. We're under grace. And so here we see one man was bun mate, was one woman was a bun mate, which is Hagar, that Sarah being the other by a free woman, verse 23, but he who was of the bun woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by the promise. And those who are, who are saved today are under the promise, amen? Thank God for that. It says in verse 24, for which things are an allegory or a, or a symbol, you could say, for these are the two covenants. In other words, he said, we can look at the story of Isaac, in Ishmael, and we can see a symbol here of the future and the new covenants here. And it said these are the two covenants, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, the New Covenant. We see two covenants here. The one from the Mount Sinai, which generates to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So when you look at that place now, it's an Arab nation, right? Uh, and the Arabs are under bondage. They're under false religion even to this day. Okay. Then it goes and it says here. Uh, let's see where I left off here. What verse am I on? 26. Here we go. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Which states that our home is in heaven. Amen. Above. Uh, for all eternity. We see that. Which is the mother of us all. Verse 27. For it is written, rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And so there are many that are lost. Verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. In other words, Father Abraham is our father, spiritual father. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is till now. And what do we find today? We see persecution of those who are Christians all across the world. The Bible gave that prophecy right here. Verse 30, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bum woman and her son. We saw that Abraham sent them away into the wilderness. For the son of the bum woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. And verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bum woman, but we are free. Amen. Amen. I know it's a whole lot there, folks, but it's a, it's a lot to rejoice over in the promise of our Savior. See that his prophecy has come true, and we can even see it fulfilled even today in our lives as we live here on earth. We see here that Isaac typifies those who are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Not by their own merit or natural descent, but by divine grace alone are we the children of God. Amen. And by divine miracle alone. We see secondly that Ishmael typifies those who depend upon their natural heritage and duties. These are those who are not what we would call born again and are not therefore a part of God's spiritual family. Paul 
preached to the unsaved Jews in Romans 10, 1 through 4. Very familiar scripture. He says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Said, what is he talking about? Well, Paul was one of them at one point, but he got saved. He was Saul and became Paul. He had a zeal for the religious thing. He actually persecuted Christians. We know the story, very familiar to us. But now he's on the other side and he's given a testimony. Now he has a burden. For the same ones he persecuted, he has the same burden they have now. And he goes on, he has a burden for his people. It's so great, as a matter of fact, uh, it's so, salvation is so real to Paul. He says here, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness... Righteousness and going about to establish, look what it says here, their own righteousness. Have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He says in another section that he would be willing to give up his own salvation for his people. Wow, that's amazing when you think about it. And so we see there in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16, we see here it says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which is in Judea, are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things. When they became followers, they began to suffer. It says, of your own countrymen, even as they that have of the Jews, who have both, what it says here, killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sin all way, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. You know, oftentimes we'll knock on doors, and we'll, we'll knock on the door of someone who is of a different faith. And the minute we begin to share the gospel, there's some resentment there. And they begin to talk about their own religion. I was knocking on doors yesterday, and we knocked on the door of a Jehovah Witness and a Mormon. And so one of the things that I use when I knock on the doors, I often say, uh, what do you believe? You know, that way they keep the door, but they don't slam in our face, amen. And they'll begin to talk about what they believe. And I, like yesterday, for give you a perfect example, the Mormon began to say that. I said, well, who is the Savior to you? And he said, uh, he is God's son. Okay. I said, so that means he's God. Well, no, he's God's son. Well, how can he be God's son and not God? Isn't God holy and pure and perfect? And you can just see the confusion. He says, well, I got something on the stove. So, uh, you, I mean, I'm sorry. But, you know, he start began to make excuses in other words. In other words, you know, it's all here, folks, is what I'm trying to say. Amen. It's all in the word of God. People just read the Bible and take it at face value. It's all here. And so the Bible says those who are not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God are under the wrath of God. It says here, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. You see, the unregenerate Christian denominations are another example of this. I think about the, in the Bible where it says that they, the Pharisees, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do worship me by the teaching and the commandments and the doctrine of men, right? And so we know that to be the case in our day-to-day. -day. The second thing we see is we see the offering of Isaac in Genesis 22. I want to read something by J. Sitlow Baxter. It says this. He says, this is one of the most amazing passages in the entire Bible, and it is a lovely type of the cross of Jesus Christ. Isaac would be about 25 years of age. And for 25 years, Abraham had, wait, had waited for him to be born so that Isaac had been in his heart for 50 years. Yet now God tells the father to slay his son. Wow. In other words, 25 years until he was born and in 25 years until this moment that we find here in Genesis chapter 22. Let's go ahead and look at some practical lessons we find from Genesis 22. The first thing we see is that, that this was a test of faith and not a temptation to evil. You know, God never tempts us to evil, folks. He never does. You know, that's important to know because as a young Christian, many young Christians don't get this. You know, oftentimes lost people say, well, well, if God calls this sin, then why did he create me to have this desire? Until we're able to get saved and then get on the other side and, and grow in our faith, we don't understand this. And even some Christians struggle with this, that God does not tempt us to sin. He really doesn't. Say, so, well, prove that. Well, look at what it says here. In Genesis 22, verse 1, it says, and it came to pass after these things, that God did tempt Abraham, or tested Abraham, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I, here I am. And so we know the devil tempts us in order to what? To destroy us. Amen. He wants to destroy us. If we're a Christian, he wants to destroy our testimony. He said of Peter, that I desire you that I may sift you as wheat. He won't destroy his testimony, his own life. But Jesus Christ came to give us life that we may have it more abundantly. Amen. Oftentimes when I'm, I'm preaching in a, a, you know, a jail or 
or halfway house or whatever the case may be, I'll, I'll preach on that, how Christ wants to give us the abundant life. And these are men that are living in, in dire situations. I, I've went into many of those places and seen men that were uh, younger than I am, probably half my age, but look twice as old as I do because of the hard life they've lived following Satan and the desires of Satan. But God wants to give us that abundant life. And so we see here that the devil tempts us to destroy us where God tests us in order to bless us. Did y'all get that? James 1 says this. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That word is perseverance. You say, well, I want to be strong in my faith. I want to be able to stand. Well, your faith is going to have to be tested. You say, well, why is that? So that we might turn our full attention upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we, we may realize that everything in this world is unstable. And when we put our faith in it, and we can do that as a Christian, we will never have peace in our heart. But when we realize that Jesus Christ is, 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 is precious, when we realize that he will never renege on his promises, and that we can always count on him and rely on him, I love where it says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Amen? That's the God that we serve. And so that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be in a place where we can focus completely on him and trust completely in him with our lives. Not just for salvation, but also by living faith. That's why we have trials in our life. That's what God is trying to do. He's trying to show us that when we give our lives to him, he'll begin to bless our life. You know, the Bible says that he that saves his life shall what? Shall lose it. Who he gives his life for my sake will gain it, right? That's what we're talking about right here. So that's what testing from God is all about. And then he goes on and says that, we will be satisfied. You read chapter, uh, verse 4 in James 1 that we'll come to a place of contentment. I believe that's where Apostle Paul was. He went from persecuting Christians to getting saved to come to a place where he became all things to all men. His ultimate desire that all men be, might be saved. That was his purpose in life. You see, he was a tent maker, but when you heard the name Paul, you didn't think of his career, but you thought of the fact that he was a Christian first. Amen? That's where God wants us to be. Look what it says about Satan in James 1, 13, that same chapter, James gives these sentiments. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is ticed. Amen? And so Satan is the one who's behind that type of temptation. See, God knows our, our, our limit. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says this, very familiar scripture, There hath no temptation taking you, but such as is coming to men. It, and it's funny, we look at this and say, man, that's a very familiar scripture. I know it by heart. I can quote it. But oftentimes, how often do we get our eyes off Jesus we begin to look at one another or look at our situation? And we forget that everyone in this room this morning is tempted the same way. We might have different areas of weakness in some areas, but we all go through the same battle. That's why we all must love each other, amen, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And come together in the unity of faith and encourage one another. That's really what it's all about. We forget that, but sometimes we get stuck on our situation. And we forget that we're all in this battle together. But don't ever forget we've already won the war. Amen? Amen? Silo Bastard said this, when the devil tempts, it is that he, the tempted, may fall. But when God tests, it is that the tested may stand. And we know that the faith that has not been tested is no faith at all. Amen. Secondly, we see that Abraham obeyed without delay, even though the command seemed extreme. Sometimes God will ask us to do things that don't make sense. Sometimes God asks us to do things that are extreme. We can always trust him. No wonder the Bible called, said that God called Abraham a friend. In James 2.23 it says, And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What a beautiful thing to be known as a friend of God. To stand before the Lord Jesus Christ one day, and he says, welcome, my friend. Amen? What a beautiful picture we see here. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Number three, we see that Abraham trusted in God during the hardest trial and in the darkest hour of his life. In Hebrews chapter 11, we get a little bit more insight to the story. In Genesis 22, it gives us a, a view of what happens, how Abraham took his, his only son up to that Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. But it doesn't give us the reason 
or the reason he was able to get through it and what his faith was in. Here we find a little more insight in the New Testament that sheds light to this Old Testament story. In Hebrews 11, look at verse 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried or tested, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Again, we see a picture of Christ here. It says, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So here we see here an insight. Abraham understood that God made a promise that God could not lie. He said that, that through his lineage that all the world would be blessed. He would have many seeds as numerous as the stars in the heavens. He knew that. And the sands of the earth. But then we see a problem here. That only son was about to be sacrificed. And if that was the case, how would God's promises come true? Well, we get a little insight here. He says that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He says, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he also he received him in a figure. You get that, folks? So Abraham said, hey, God made me a promise. God's going to keep it. I trust him, so therefore I can go ahead and go through this. I believe God with all my heart. And if it be the case that I kill my son, God will raise him from the dead. Amen? Do we have that type of faith this morning, folks, in God's promises? Do we live like we really believe the Bible? Amen? That's a good question. And then fourth, we see that God rewards sacrifice. God rewards sacrifice. Look at Matthew 19. You know, it's been rightly said that it is impossible to outgive God. How many of y'all have heard that? It's impossible to outgive God. I'm so thankful. Many of us have experienced that in our own life. You know, even when we talk about our missions conference and giving to Faith Promise, I've seen God bless in a tremendous way in our family. I remember when I was saved while I was in college, uh, and I first heard about Faith Promise, and I prayed about it. And, you know, in college, you don't ever have a lot of money. And you realize later you never have a lot of money, right? Anyway, uh, and I made a promise to God, God, I'm going to give so much. And every year, I'm going to increase it by this much. Now, it wasn't very much, I'll admit that. But I didn't realize that 20 years later, it was gonna be a whole lot, <laughs> you know? And so God has always been faithful to my family as we've kept that promise. And my, my wife kind of married into that promise, you know what I'm saying? I had to explain it to her after we got married. Okay, honey, uh, a few years back, I made this promise to God. And, and so she's seen God bless us through that. So God is faithful, we cannot outgive him, amen? There's certain things you don't tell your young people well, anyway, we won't go there. Matthew 19, 29. Look what it says here. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, I love this, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. You know, as I look at my life, and, you know, it dawns on me that I, I'm actually a missionary. You say, what do you mean? I have no family within a thousand miles of this place. And many times I wake up in the morning and say, man, why am I here? I have to remind myself of why I'm here. And as my parents get older, uh, their health is deteriorating and, and all these kind of things, I begin to worry. I begin to miss my family. I really do. But I come back to verses like this that remind me of my purpose, remind me of why I'm here and what it's all about, that in heaven there will be no more separation, no more pain, no more death. Amen? That we have the precious promise of God. We, we have to rely on these things for encouragement. But the Bible says, I know a friend of mine who surrendered to ministry, as a matter of fact, uh, as a pastor, uh, gave up everything, sold everything, went to his new position, and the church gave him a house. Brand new house. Paid for. His. Amen? God is good. And Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. In other words, if we give abundantly to the Lord, we give out of a cheerful heart, God will bless us tremendously. I'm not just talking about monetarily. Our needs will be met. You be assured of that. But there are blessings that money cannot buy. And there are blessings that we cannot get from this world that God provides when we give to him. Amen? I'm talking about a peace in our family. Having a little taste of heaven on earth in our home. Having children that love and obey the Lord and know him. I mean, there's just so many things I can go on and on about what the things that God do that we cannot do. You see, as a counselor, when I sit in my office, all day long I'm hearing complaints from parents of unruly children that they've raised. Know all the time who they need is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the Bible is in the scriptures. Or, I'm sorry, the answer is in the scriptures, amen? And God gives us, you know, a young person, Solomon says a young person can be made wise by just reading the book of Proverbs. Amen? 
The Bible says, with all thy getting, get understanding. You see, without understanding, without God's wisdom, we have nothing. Amen? In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. As I think about our Sunday school teachers back, back here right now, teaching my son, teaching my daughter. These are folks who don't get a lot of notoriety in our church or anywhere else in our country, but God takes note of what they do. God takes notes when they stay up and prepare for our children and are a blessing and encouragement. There are many missionaries on the field. I think of Samuel Morrison, who was in Africa for over 40 years, happened to come back uh, after, retire, after retiring from the field, coming back on the same boat that Theodore Roosevelt was on. And as he was approaching on that same ship, he saw all the, the festivities and balloons and all of the celebrants waiting on the pier for, him to, for the boat to arrive. And all the attention was on Teddy Roosevelt. And as Samuel Morrison, who had just left the mission field after 40 years in Africa, walked off that boat, no one even knew he was there. But God knew. God knows what he's done. Amen? We don't need the glories of men. But God says he, he promises that if we sow in abundance, he will also allow us to reap in abundance. Amen? You know how many times I've gone into a Walmart, gone to a register. I remember one time buying bullets for my gun. That's what all explains exciting. Or getting my fishing license. And I get to a counter, and I see a face that I recognize. I'm real good with memorizing faces, but I always forget the names. Okay, if you're not old enough to understand that, one day you will. Amen? And I get to the counter, and this young man says, man, you look so familiar. He says, hey, Mr. Ashley, I just want you to know that I'm still following the Lord. I'm going to church. I still remember what you told me. I, I can give you about a million stories of these type of episodes where I thought, hey, I said something, it fell on deaf ears, and then... That's it. And I think I'm so thankful. I, you know, I can't wait to heaven, when I get to heaven to see all that God has done through the life of our people. But every now and then, God will let us see a little glimpse of what he's done through us. Every now and then, he'll do that to encourage us. Amen? And I run into those situations all the time in our community. Lastly, let's go ahead and see the typical lesson here. We see, first of all, we see a type of Christ in this story, in Isaac. We see Abraham as a type of God the Father. He was willing to offer his son. In Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Think about that for a moment. Who did the Lord bruise him for? Sinners such as you and I. But yet he was pleased to do so. God proved his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that for a moment. God loves us so. You see, there's a saying that says this, there was every reason in man that God should hate him, but yet God loved him. And there's every reason in God that man should love him, yet man hates him. Wow, that's amazing. And the Bible says, he had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The second thing we see here is that Isaac is a type of Christ. Let's look at four ways that Isaac is a type of Christ. Number one, he was miraculously born son who came into the world at the set time according to God's promise. We saw that earlier in Genesis 22 where at a set time he came and that he was a promise and it was a miracle and so forth. We saw that there earlier. The second thing we see here is he was the type of Christ that he was willing to give his life to please his father. Nowhere do we see in Genesis 22 where Isaac resisted his father. Nowhere do we find that but he was willingly giving himself just like Jesus was willing to lay down his life for his father. In John 8, 29, it says, And he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that what? Please him. Isn't that what we desire in our children's heart, that they would always love to please us and desire to follow us? I remember, I'm going to go embarrass my daughter, because I already explained to them that that's what we're going to do for the next few years, uh, unfortunately, because I'm one of the pastors here. So anyway, they got to live with it, right? And they can do about it. But the other day, not too long ago, I would say about a couple months ago, and it's a good, it's a good, it's a good ending, by the way. I asked my daughter to do me a favor. I sent her to go find somebody for me, and she was talking to her little friends, and it happened right here at church. And, you know, they're cool, they think they're cool sometimes when they're with their friends, and and she didn't, she was like, oh, Dad. I said, what? <laughs> I can't believe this. You don't want to go do this for me? And she just kind of looked, she put her head down, and then she went. Well, that night, that same night, I brought it up again. 
Hun, I can't believe you, you did that. When I asked you to go do that, I thought you'd be happy to do something for dad. And a little tear started running down her face. She started crying. And it wasn't my intention to make her feel bad, but I wanted her to realize. Sometimes we do that to the Lord, amen? The Lord asks us to do something. She says, Lord, really? You want me to do that? I don't have time for that, right? Thirdly, we see that he questioned his father, but in faith, not in doubt. Here we see it's okay to question the Lord if it's in the right heart, amen? In Genesis 22, verse 7, it says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That's a very good question, right? Sometimes we look around, we, we try to add it up and subtract it, and we look around and say, It doesn't make sense. Lord, why are you asking me to do this, right? In Matthew 27, we see the same thing in verse 46. We see the Lord Jesus himself questioning the father. It says, about the, ninth, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, I don't know how to say that, so we're going to skip over it. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, we get a more vivid picture when it's prophesied in Psalm 22, which is about the prophecy of the crucifixion. In verse 1, it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Here we find a more descriptive picture of what took place there. Jesus Christ, had, at that moment, taken on all the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future, and there could no longer be in the presence of God. He was completely separated in darkness from God the Father. He felt all that there. You know, it kind of reminds us of the type of Christ we find in the Old Testament when the priest uh, was bringing an offering for the people of Israel, and there were two goats there. One was a scapegoat, if you remember the story. And what he would do is he would confess the sins of Israel on that one scapegoat, and he would give it to a, a mighty man, a strong man, the Bible says in the Old Testament, and that strong man would take him by the, by the horns and lead him out far away from the tabernacle, as far as he could go, away from any civilization, from any hunters or any type of uh, other goats that may keep that goat company. And then that, when that goat began to cry out, it was a picture of being lost, a picture of being separated from God. Just like Jesus Christ was here, that scapegoat was a picture of Jesus Christ and what he went through. He felt every uh, bit of that loneliness there for you and I for our sins. God is good, amen? And then lastly, we see that he was raised up figuratively. In Hebrews 11, verse 19, it says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And we say figure because... We know that Jesus Christ is what we celebrate today. He is risen. Amen? He is risen. He did not stay in the grave. And so Christ was raised up literally. Here we see it figuratively. And so we know that Isaac was never killed and therefore did not have to be raised from the dead. But we know that Abraham had that heart's intention to obey God fully. And in closing, we'll look at the prophetic lesson real quickly. We see that Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. In Genesis 22, look at verse 2. It says, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou, I love what it says here, whom thou lovest. He wanted to make sure we understood this wasn't an unruly son. This is not one that was uh, the black sheep of the family. Matter of fact, he was the only son here. And it says, and, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And so here we find that this was exactly was the place where Solomon's temples was built. As a matter of fact, it tells us in 2 Chronicles 3.1, it says, And Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor. So here we find a place, Moriah, where the Abrahamic covenant was promised to Abraham, but also the Davidic covenant was promised to David at the same place. And then later we find that Jesus Christ will be crucified in that same location where Jesus literally died right here. And so we see a prophetic lesson here that Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. And so as we close, uh, next week what we want to do is look at Genesis 24. And we're going to be looking at the, the life of Isaac and Rebekah. We're going to look at it for, for two weeks. The first thing we're going to do is look at the relationship between the son and his bride, Isaac and Rebekah. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and the church. And we're going to see that in the scriptures. It'll be pretty neat when we look at this. And then the second week, we're going to look at the position between husband and wife. And, uh, and if you're a parent, you'll get a lot of value out of this as we see God's heart on that issue. And so 
you can see some of the nuances here. Abraham is a picture of the Heavenly Father in this story. Isaac is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The servant is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, many look over this, but Laban, who was Rebekah's brother, if you remember him, he was a picture of a sinner who rejects Christ. And then we find that Rebekah was representative of you and I, the bride of Christ, the church. And so we'll begin to see this uh, next week as we look into this. And uh, there'll be a whole lot we can glean from that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you for uh, your precious promises. Lord, I pray that uh, you be with us as we look forward to the morning service. Lord, I pray that as we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, that we could remind ourselves of the love that drew salvation's plan, that we can remind ourselves of the fact that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, that you have an unconditional love for us, that you love the sinner, but you hate the sin. Lord, help us that are saved to be reminded of the fact that we need to live holy lives, lives that are devoted to you, that we might now with our lives you've given us bring glory and honor to your name. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for uh, all that you do for us, how you intercede for us and uh, pray for us for the things we don't know how to pray for, I don't know we have need of, and how, Lord, you and your sovereignty allow us to reap what we sow. Lord, we don't understand that, but, Lord, help us by faith to accept that, to accept you in all of your essence, to not try to figure things out, but to lean upon you, not our own understanding, and that in all our ways we'll acknowledge you and allow you to direct our paths. We thank you, Lord, so much for our promises in your book. Lord, be with us again as I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.